Hello and welcome back, everyone. Um, this week, we are starting a new case study on recommender systems. So in this video, I'm going to introduce a lot of the ideas of recommender systems. And then um, in class today, we're going to be talking about something slightly unrelated to recommender systems specifically, but thinking about this idea of reducing the number of dimensions in our data set. And the reason we're going to do this, it will feel a little out of order, is this idea of dimensionality reduction and some of the techniques we'll use are going to be really helpful in making us understand how to make a really good recommender system. So it'll feel a little bit unrelated in class when we talk about this idea of PCA, dimensionality reduction, but I promise you it's to build up this notion of a more complex recommender system. So in this video, what I want to focus on is kind of introducing the notions of recommender systems kind of and some of the challenges. And then in class for today, we'll focus on this idea of dimensionality reduction and set up that problem there. So whenever we want to recommend products, you can imagine there are lots and lots of applications. Anytime you have a catalog of items and people using those items, you might want to personalize someone's experience to help them find products that are mo the most useful for them or whatever useful might mean in some context. So personalization is transforming the way that you as a consumer experience the world. Any major website now that serves content has some personalization algorithms to help you find content that they think you'll like. YouTube recommends which videos to show you, Netflix which movies or which shows, Amazon which products or Spotify which songs. Facebook shows you which of your friends' posts are you most likely to actually care about, and many, many more. Now, this is not some universally good thing. There are lots and lots of problems that come from how companies go about recommending products. For example, uh, Facebook usually comes under a lot of fire for thinking about how it creates these bubbles or people or echo chambers where people only see maybe political news or other news from something that lines up with their worldview. And it could be kind of challenging if there might be some notion of mission information going bubbles. Okay? So there is usually lots and lots of challenges with recommender systems. Now, in this class, in 416, you're not going to try to talk too much about ways of trying to fix these really important problems about recommender systems in the real world, mostly because we're still trying to figure that out. We don't have really great answers right now. This is a very pressing problem, but one we're still trying to figure out the right answer. So my hope is to give you a really good understanding of some techniques that companies are using right now, and that can help you when you go to explore ways of fixing this in the future, alternatives or changes these techniques to improve kind of uh, these recommender systems for society. So at a very high level, recommender systems are almost always focused on having a system with users and products, and they want to find a set of products to recommend to the user based on that user's preferences. Now, in general, a recommender system's job is to recommend which items or which products a user will like, or maybe brings the most utility to a user, based on something that the user's kind of abstract notion of preferences. Now, in this lecture, we're really focusing on this idea of recommending movies to you. But I promise you, you could just switch all our terminology for when we're thinking about movies to switching it to which product to recommend. So lots and lots of things uh, you could do here, even though in our example, we're just going to be focusing on recommending for, for simplicity. So before I can show you an algorithm for thinking about how to do a recommender system, I want to point out that the idea of recommending things to people is, is actually a very, very challenging problem for lots of reasons. So particularly thinking about the types of feedback you get from users. If I recommend a, uh, a movie to someone, hopefully, you know, sometimes you'll get like a star rating that shows up and they'll click you and say, I really like this or I really hated this. Whenever you have some kind of notion of the user giving you explicit feedback that I did like this movie or I did not like this movie, this is generally a much easier problem to solve. Usually there's still will be lots of challenges that will run. Into. But if you actually get the user to tell you what they think or what they like, 
that usually will make the problem a lot simpler. However, it's always the case that you have explicit feedback from the user. You may not be able to gather it, or people might not respond very frequently, even if you ask for that explicit feedback. So a lot of times you might also be using implicit feedback, things that we might infer about the user based off usage patterns. Oh, whoops, go back. Things like time spent on the website, or maybe click rate. Or if you're a company, you probably care about money earned. So lots of different things you might care about. You might try to use those signals in kind of your notion of your recommender system. And this I'll mention is one of the big places that a lot of these problems and recommender comes up is which metrics you use kind of really affect the behavior of the system. A great example is a lot of recommender systems use click data. If you clicked on the article or clicked on the video, and then naturally, you might imagine that the videos that have the more shocking or clickbaity headlines or pictures on them are the ones that generally get clicked on more, which then the algorithm suggests those more. And you can get into a bunch of really difficult problems here. So we're not making a stance on necessarily which metrics you should use. We're just saying that there are lots of metrics and you should be a little bit careful to avoid feedback loops. And I'll explain what that is. Okay, so that's one challenge is what type of feedback do you get? Different systems get different types of feedback. Also thinking about a recommended system as maybe the most likely things that people will like um, can be a little bit challenging when you actually think about the types of content that are out there. So for example, you could imagine trying to say, well, the recommender system should tell you the top five or top K movies you'll think this user will like. And so if someone liked Rocky One, it's a movie about boxing, you might also assume that they probably will like Rocky 2, 3, 4, and 5, and I don't actually watch the Rocky movies, so I, I don't know. If, I'm sorry if I don't know. That. But you can imagine that there is sometimes redundancy between the types of content out there. There's usually lots of similar content about the same series or about the same um, thing, and if our recommender system only recommended Rocky content, might get burnt out pretty quickly, right? Run out of content. And so usually what you also wanna think about is how do you make your recommendations diverse? Because one, people are just multifaceted and uh, we might want to make sure that they can find extra information. Also, maybe just in from a recommended standpoint that you don't wanna uh, put someone in a corner and say only recommend Rocky movies. You might wanna hedge your bets a bit to help them explore new content. So maybe instead, a better recommendation would be something like Rocky II, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and Robin Hood, or just whatever. These are just stand-ins, random things on Netflix. You could already maybe see how the notion of recommender systems and how we measure them is very challenging, because even if we could come up with some metric to kind of identify what, what these are, the notions of quality are very subjective. Which one of these are the better sets of recommendations? It depends on a lot of factors. And so this will also be another thing where we're encoding values into our machine learning pipeline by determining which metrics we think are important. Okay, here's another really big challenge with recommenders. When a new movie comes out, we won't know who's like, who likes it. We sometimes call this the cold start problem. So when a movie comes into the system for the first time, or maybe a user comes in for the first time, we have no idea and have no information about them. And it's gonna be very, very challenging for a recommender system to know whether or not it should recommend that user or not. Now, there are approaches around this. Maybe if it's brand new, you know you should just recommend it to a bunch of users, maybe, to like see who starts to like it and then maybe make more predictions from there. But there are lots of heuristics and lots of challenges that Almost always, a very common approach is these recommender systems use side information. What I mean by that is the system has other information like genre, who's in the movies, if it's a sequel or not, and they use that information to get a kind of initial idea of who might like this movie because it might be similar to some other movies. But again, how do you encode that in a system is actually kind of a really interesting modeling challenge. 
and we really want to try to learn these quickly or as quickly as possible. And so we'll see there's a bit of a trade-off here between how much you kind of share the movie out because it's new, but maybe that ruins the recommendations for more users because they might not be interested in it versus trying to learn a lot about that movie from the first place. So lots of interesting I have a couple other challenges I want to pose, and then I'm going to talk about an initial solution. Uh, so one, I, another challenge is people's interests in products change over time. So for example, if you consider something like bell-bottom jeans, um, are, are those popular or not? Well, it also kind of depends on time. Is it seven? Is it 1977? Is it 1998? Or is it 2011? Depending on kind of what circles you might run in and what time periods you might run in, the idea of are bell-bottom jeans in changes or not. I think that's what the... I actually don't know. Then I guess. But what, I, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at is that people's preferences evolve over time and trends come in and go out. And you need to think about how might a model be responsive to that because that's a very challenging thing that preferences might change over time. So whenever we come up with a recommender system, it needs to have flexibility, both in the macro scale, that over a long periods of times, preferences might change overall, and on the micro scale, things on month to month, or maybe year to year, things might change quite wildly, depending on what's in or what's not, or what's hyped, right? And there's also just so much variability in all of this. What gets hyped up is almost random, in that something blows up on TikTok or Facebook or something, and then everyone wants that product. But it's a little random for which products actually blow up. In so you can imagine that there's lots and lots of challenges here. We're trying to make these systems flexible over time, but also still useful. And then finally, one big point of concern that we're going to have to tackle with is just a question of efficiency, how these systems can scale. For example, if we'll think about many systems, for example, movie recommended as having N users and M movies. And if we want to come up with an approach for recommendation, we'll probably want an algorithm that can scale with the number of users and the number of movies we have present. In particular, maybe many naive or many uh, simple algorithms might take something like N cubed plus M cubed time. That means if you double the number of users and movies, it will take about eight times as long to figure out what movie you should recommend next because of this cubic nature, two cubed is eight. So generally, these algorithms can't be potentially really slow, and that's something we'll have to consider. And so a lot of focus that has gone into this work recently has been thinking about how to make these more efficient and how can we make more faster approximate methods as necessary. And I'll mention one, th one thing I, I forgot to include in the slide. I, I I guess I'm safe, is also thinking about this societal impact. That a lot of focus over the past decade has really gone into how do we make these systems faster and better, but a lot of more recent work has been going into what types of behaviors do these systems enable? What types of feedback loop might they make if we recommend the most popular product? Does this just recommend the same content over and over again? And could this cause some sort of societal harm? And this has been a huge amount of work, fairness and bias, particularly towards recommended or recent. Okay, so I wanna show you a couple example recommender systems to show you, and we'll talk about some pros and cons to them. So what I would argue is the simplest recommender system imaginable is just recommend the most popular products. It's very straightforward as an, as an approach, might already get a sense that there might be some problems with this approach, but it's a recommender system. For any product or any movie, just recommend the, the most popular movie on the system. So the simplest approach is just rank whatever is popular. So just sort all the movies by watch history or click-through rate or whatever we actually cared about in our metric for feedback, and then recommend the most popular one. Now, there is some huge limitations here. One being no personalization, like, I might not like the most popular movies, or you might like one of them, but not all of them. There's no notion of trying to personalize to me or to you in a popular. So one 
Um, another big limitation of this kind of simplest, simplistic approach is what we call a feedback. And I've mentioned this idea of a feedback loop a few times now. What a feedback loop is, is the choices of the model then further kind of enforcing or reinforcing the model's choices later on. So you can imagine in this popularity-based model, where if you just recommend the most popular movies, then the most popular movies will just continue to become more and more popular because it's the only thing you're recommending. It's really hard for new movies or high quality movies that weren't at the top originally to, to get up to the top. So if you have a model that's purely based on popularity, it causes a feedback loop where the model makes predictions and then those predictions get used by people, which then get fed back into the model because they've now increased the popularity count, which can then get in this kind of vicious cycle over and over again, where it will continue to recommend the same thing over and over and over. There's many different ways feedback loops can happen. I think for the popularity model, it's the most straightforward, but that's something you should always be thinking about, is does my model's choices potentially impact choices it will make in the future? And can that loop cause harm? That's a really important thing to think. Maybe in the case of popularity, it's not clear what the harm is besides making it hard for new content creators to, to make it to the top. But recommending Avengers on Netflix probably isn't the most harmful thing you can imagine. But you can imagine many other scenarios where feedback loops cause great harm. So let's try something a little bit more complex, not just a popularity video. So for example, instead, let's think about using something like classification. So the idea is let's try to use classification to help build a recommender system. The idea is build some classifier using techniques that we've talked about before, like regression or decision trees or, you know, k-nearest neighbors if you want. Really any type of model that we could do and trying to classify whether or not a user would like this product or not. So maybe doing something like take his features, information about the user, information about the product, maybe information about other information, like what have they purchased in the past or watched in the past, and really any other info you might think is relevant. And then just model this as a classification problem for every user and product, try to predict whether or not they will like that product. And then maybe if we uh, output some kind of probability, we can sort them by the most likely for the user to like it. So this might be a context where you really want probability prediction. So this approach is much, much better than the, the popularity-based approach. It's personalized. If you use features about the users and the products, you can find information about the user to help them find things that they want. And this approach is super, super flexible. You can uh, handle almost any of the challenges I've talked about before by just using features relevant for those things. So for example, if you use time of day or recent history or trends in the system as features, you could potentially capture things like changing preferences over time. Now, that might not be easy to do, but you can do it by just adding features or changing the models that can handle this. And potentially, you could build models that are robust to limited information about users. So maybe, for example, if you know things about age or their location or something else, you might be hopefully be able to get some at least fault predictions for them, assuming your model was able to come up with predictions for people with little information, which then kind of goes back to our conversation last week of making models that are robust to missing data. That might be a really important idea context. Now, this is not all just good. There's lots of challenges with fire. In particular, the features might not be available or they might be really hard to work with. Um, what I was just saying is that maybe many of these features are missing and we talked about lots of very difficult challenges when you have missing data. A big idea is how much missing data you have and it's really, really challenging in a lot of cases to make it turns out that these classification methods tend to not work super well in practice. 
we'll see a new method we'll explore on Wednesday, on Wednesday called collaborative filtering. And this type of model works really, really well in a lot of practice because it, it's not trying to learn this predictive task. It's really trying to learn how users and products relate to each other. I will explain how that works. So um, even in this kind of world of learning a classifier, even if you can get it to work, it might not actually work that well when compared to more complex types of models that we'll talk about. And then finally, this doesn't remove the notion of a feedback loop. Depending on which features you're using, you can then create yet again another feedback loop, but maybe one that's a little bit more challenging to deal with or maybe more challenging to spot. So for example, uh, one big problem that we've talked about before with bias and fairness is ways that information about race might make its way into, its mo into a model inadvertently or intentionally that might cause kind of different impacts. And you can imagine that those different impacts might then do a feedback loop. And so now the feedback loops present might get a little bit scarier or more difficult to work with, or maybe difficult to spot as well. So this idea of feedback loops will actually, as a bit of a spoiler, will end up being a problem with every type of recommender system model. Uh, but they all take different forms and the approaches to try to solve them or spot them might be different. And we're not going to show you any of those ideas because it's also really context dependent. How to spot feedback loops in YouTube is very different than how to spot feedback loops in Facebook. So all of the ideas of trying to measure and define what a feedback loop is, is usually very context dependent and, and a pretty challenging. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave off for today. We've introduced the idea of recommender systems and a lot of the challenges because it's a, in some sense, a slightly ill-posed problem. That, I mean, even though we wanna recommend products and that sounds pretty straightforward, there's lots of nuance and subjectivity that comes in here that will make this a very difficult modeling task. And we talked about two approaches so far to doing recommendation. One was just a very simple popularity-based model. Um, and next, we talked about learning a classifier which does kind of maybe mesh with the approaches we've seen before, but we'll see that this approach is rather limited and that it doesn't do so well in practice. Okay. That's recommender system. So in class today, um, we're gonna take a bit of a, what might seem like a detour and focus on this idea of dimensionality reduction. You have data with lots and lots of features trying to reduce the number of features down to something small and manageable. Now this will seem very unrelated to this idea of document, uh, or sorry, recommender systems. And in some sense it is. It has nothing necessarily to do with recommender systems. It's a very general idea. It applies to regression or classification, but also works for document retrieval and um, recommender system. The reason I want to introduce this now, even though it feels like a little bit out of order, is the ideas for this one particular algorithm we'll talk about, PCA, is actually very useful in understanding kind of what a more complex recommender system is about, trying to reduce the dimensionality of this. And so to do that, we want to introduce what dimensionality reduction is. So this week, or today's class, we're going to focus on this idea of making our data smaller. And I'll explain all of the ideas and, and concepts behind that class today. 